Thank you for, uh, for sticking around for the last session here. Uh, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about a project called Travel Mapping, both a, kind of a hobbyist side of that project and an uh, a academic side of that project. Uh, my name is Jim Teresco. I'm on the computer science faculty at Siena College, which is just outside Albany, New York. All right, so um, quick overview of what I'm going to tell you here today. First, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my road geek credentials. Why am I doing this? I'll tell you then about that hobbyist project and then on to the educational side of the project and then, uh, then tell you how all the people who were involved in this and, and give them a little bit of credit as well. Um, if you decide this is wonderful, uh, I've got a QR code up there with this talk and I've got tons of links within this presentation that'll take you to the various projects. So, um, so anyway, what is, uh, what is this all about? Why am I doing this? Well, long before I was a computer science geek, I was a map geek. Um, I think I'm in good company at this conference with that. Uh, it was no surprise that when Ken Jennings wrote this map head book, a couple of people got it for me. Um, I have my well-worn collection of old Rand McNally road atlases in my closet at home, uh, all marked up with the travels that I had in that year over, uh, over several years. And there's one in my backpack right there that I'm using on this trip. Uh, along the way, I, I started to take lots of pictures of not just the places I go, but the roads I travel. That seems like an odd thing, but again, maybe not among this crowd. Um, I think uh, this is something that maybe I was a little ahead of Google Street Maps and all that kind of stuff. But uh, So I've got thousands and thousands of pictures of, of places with the signs along the way. Um, <clears throat> When I'm at a computer science conference, I justify this. Uh, Donald Knuth is one of the big founders of algorithms, basically, uh, one of the fathers of the discipline. He has a web page of pictures of road signs, and if it's good enough for Knuth, it's certainly good enough for me. Uh, I like to collect things also, and uh, one of the websites I found oh, many years ago now is called mobrule.com. You can, and this is not my website, this is uh, the guy named Marty O'Brien. Uh, and, and this website, you can keep track of all the counties you've been to in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I've only got one in Mexico, but I've got uh, quite a few here in the, in the U.S., including 20. I came out a day early and took a little drive around southeastern Minnesota, southwestern, rather, Minnesota. And then uh, around 2009, I discovered this project. It was called the Clinched Highway Mapping Project. In fact, at first, it was called the Interstate Highway Mapping Project, uh, run by a guy named Tim Reichard. And what this thing lets you do is keep track of the roads you've traveled to. I think this is, this is great. So I spent, I don't know how many weekends, uh, figuring out where did we go on that cross country trip in 85. Uh, talked to my father, what, do you remember, did we go this way or that way? Looking through old records and, and, and picture sets and things like that. Um, and it lets you produce things like this, a map that shows you where you've been. So this is from that old website. And then that website went away. Well, it didn't go away until actually just a couple of months ago. It just stopped being updated in 2014. <clears throat> and we probably had about 100 users on that site at the time. I was not a, uh, an administrator on the site or anything like that. I, I had contributed some data to the site. And I and a bunch of other CM, CHM users decided we weren't going to stand for this. So we're going to build a replacement. <clears throat> and I kind of took the lead on that. Eventually, we chose the name Travel Mapping for this project. And here's, uh, here's what it looks like today. <clears throat> lets you tra track your cumulative travels uh, entirely for fun. I mean, there's no academic side of this. I'm not sure I'm changing the world with this at all, other than wasting people's time on their weekends when they're trying to keep track this stuff. Uh, but we, we decided to build this project. And since we decided to do that, uh, we had a team instead of an individual running the thing. So we don't have the single point of failure. I think this fits in very nicely with the open street maps idea where it's a lot of people, in our case only about 20, not thousands or whatever OSM has, uh, all working together to try to keep the data updated, to try to keep the infrastructure updated, uh, and so on. Uh, we have a GitHub organization if anybody's interested in taking a look at <clears throat> some of our infrastructure and data. Uh, we've got oh, about six or seven repositories in there. I'll take a look at a little bit of the contents of that in a couple of minutes. Oops, wrong page. Back, no, back here. All right, so um, 
use, what we do here is users of this site, which is most of the people involved in it, uh, they would submit a list of highway segments that they've traveled based on some labels that we put into the data. And it's just a plain old text file. They can submit this through GitHub, they can email it to us and we'll put it into GitHub, whatever it is. And you can see the format's pretty simple. You have a region, in this case, what you see here are states, followed by a road name, followed by the endpoints of the segments that you've traveled using the names that you would find over here in, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And the results of that gives you uh, a map that looks something like this. So these are my travels in Minnesota over my lifetime. Uh, so the map is drawn over some OpenStreetMap tiles and uh, using leaflet to, uh, to display this with overlays of, of where people have been. And you can, of course, do all the things that we're used to doing. And let's suppose that I'm I got this trip to Minneapolis. Where have I not driven in Minneapolis? What should I go do? I've got this little segment of I-694 over here that I've never been on. What is that road? If I'm not sure, I can click on it. It tells me what it is. So on my way to the airport, I'm certainly going to go drive that segment of I-694 so I can say I finished it because I've got to do that. In fact, that'll complete the Minnesota interstates for me uh, personally. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the most exciting road in the city, right? Yeah. Uh, other things on travel mapping, I won't go to these, these sites here, or these parts of the site. If you're interested, you can go uh, and look for yourself. Individual users get a list of their stats. They get a list, actually, I'm going to go to this one uh, quickly here. You get a list of, uh, of the places that travel mapping knows about. Uh, how many miles have you traveled? How many roads have you traveled? How many roads have you traveled in their entirety? Uh, it breaks it down by regions. It breaks it down by highway systems, things like US interstates, Minnesota state highways. German autobahns, whatever you might uh, have, have traveled along the way. Uh, and then there are various views on that that we don't really need to, uh, to get into. So I think maybe of a little more interest to this crowd is uh, where does our data come from and, and what is this that we're dealing with here? So we don't want to have a level of detail that say the OpenStreetMaps database would have for us. That's just overwhelmingly large. We want people to be able to trap to track their travels on what we would consider major roads and places that they would reasonably, reasonably enter and exit those roads. So for limited access roads, it's very simple. It's the exits. For, uh, for state highways and things along those, uh, that level of detail, it would just be major intersections or connections to interstate highways and things along those lines. You don't want to map every single uh, intersection along the way, what are the chances somebody turned right at Oak Street out here? Not, probably not very good. They probably went all the way to some major intersection uh, down the road. And so a representation, say of, state, say, of State Highway 5 looks like this. So the points that you're allowed to map getting on and off the roads are these little, uh, uh, these little uh, yellow icons here. And in this case, it's showing um, the pink is segments that this person has traveled. And that's me, actually. And the gray are places that I have not traveled um, on that highway. So for this road, we've got a few dozen points along the way, as opposed to if you have the representation for this from OpenStreetMaps, I'm sure there are thousands of points along the way or shapes. Much more level of detail than we need for the travel mapping. But we do want to have some level of accuracy here. So we have this notion of. Uh, of hidden waypoints or shaping points along the way. Minnesota seems to be mostly fairly flat. There's not a lot of uh, mountain passes that I've encountered since I got out here. Uh, but if you go to, say, the Berkshires in western Massachusetts and you're taking Interstate 90 between exits 2 and 3, it's about 30 miles between those exits. And uh, so for travel mapping's purposes, we don't need any points in the middle, right? You're either getting on at 2 and getting off at 3 or going the other direction. You can't get off halfway. There is no way on and off legally uh, along that way. But we do want to map that segment a little bit more accurately, so we put a few points along the way to make it look reasonably good on the map. We're not trying to map every little turn and every little, uh, every little uh, possible uh, deviation of the road. So adding these doesn't add any complication for the user's point of view, but it does make their maps look prettier, and it makes the distances a little bit more accurate. All kinds of technologies that we use to build on this. You're probably familiar with many of these things. Uh, I already mentioned Git and GitHub that, that supports our collaborative development of all of this. Um, there's a site update program that 
takes a whole bunch of text files and builds a big old database for us every night. Uh, there's also a C++ version of that that one of the other collaborators has been, uh, been working on. And it runs on a free BSD server uh, sitting at Siena College at this point. And you can see the other technologies that are playing a role in here. Uh, where does OpenStreetMaps come into this? Well, OpenStreetMaps is where we can figure out where are these intersections. We can pull out individual uh, intersections. And we do that with a, with a waypoint editor. WPT stands for waypoint. Each of the files in the system uh, is, uh, is generated either manually which some people have done. Uh, I've did some of that in the early days of the project. I go through and I look at the map and I figure, what are the coordinates of this? What are the coordinates of this? What are the coordinates of this? And we have some rules that are laid out as to how we name things and how frequently we create these points and, and so on. But we've developed some tools along the way that help us. A few of our users take government data and, and, and process it automatically to build these files um, as well. Uh, but we do try to take care only to use uh, sources that we are allowed to derive this data from. So it's primarily government data sources. We've got a big list here of uh, various documents from governments around the world and other, other places uh, that we've used to help get our, our map data. So that's, that's the travel mapping side of things. I, I could go on for, for hours about the, some of the other details of the project, but I want to make sure that I talk about how do I justify this as part of my job? So I'm this road geek and I'm this computer science geek with a job teaching computer science. And we turn back to around 2010, I'm teaching over at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, and I'm teaching a data structures class. This is when the clinched highway mapping project had already taken a good chunk of my time. And um, I'm thinking this, some of these labs are pretty boring. If I'm a student in this class, I am not going to want to sit here and go through yet another made up example of some data. Uh, and then write a program that processes it to come up with meaningless results. Uh, any, I don't know if anybody's taken a computer science course, but hopefully that was not your experience, but I bet it might have been once in a while. Uh, so here was an opportunity for me to take some interesting data from, at the time, clinched highway mapping, now travel mapping, build a few tools behind the scenes, and come up with a new, uh, new lab. We were going to be doing Dijkstra's algorithm for computing single source shortest paths, basically driving directions. And uh, well, I need to have this done by next week. Can I do this? I've got a one-year-old at home. My wife wouldn't mind if I just disappear for the weekend and, and, and make a new lab, right? Well, little did we know that for the next 10 years, I'd be working on this off and on. Uh, and, uh, and it's turned into so much more than, uh, than what I had for that one little assignment. So the basic idea here is that I take the, the data from the travel mapping project, which is root-based and system-based, and I make it graph data. So I turn it into vertices at the intersections and edges uh, connecting, representing the roads. Um, and uh, I do this by region. I do this for the whole world. I do this for continents. I do this for highway systems and so on. We've got about 700 different graphs that are uh, available now, and they're generated every day from the uh, updated data uh, that are available to my students and, and others who are interested in using this. And one of the great things about it pedagogically is that I have the same format of data all the way down from something like the highways on Aruba, which is just 28 vertices and 37 edges. You can trace through that by hand in an example if you want to, all the way up to our master. And this, these numbers, I forgot to update. I was going to update them this morning. These are probably a couple months old. We have somewhere in the 400 to 500,000 range size of the number of vertices and edges. I know in the context of the worldwide map data, that's minuscule, but actually that's really good for us that it's small enough that it's still manageable. We can load that into a Java program or a Python program and do some meaningful processing on it. <clears throat> So not only do I want to have this data available for my students to use in their own programs, I'd like them to be able to see it. Those are my two big contentions on this, is that students will be more engaged if they see a real world connection to the data. So these are roads that they've possibly traveled on or heard of or places they've been or heard of, and they can see it. It's not just an abstract graph that I'm, I'm putting up on the screen. It's here's your graph put on top of a map. So you can see that these things actually represent uh, real things. So one of the graphs, and every time I give a talk related to metal, I generate a new graph based on where I'm giving that talk. So this graph represents all the highways within uh, 25 miles uh, that are known to travel mapping of us right here at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so that's a, a pretty reasonable size graph, about 700 vertices and about 780 is that? 760 uh, edges in that. So it's pretty big, but 
small enough that you can actually visualize it. Um, and over the years, this project has evolved from a static uh, system that I just described to a more dynamic system. And this has been the focus of about the last three years of fairly significant effort. There was some work on it previously, but uh, we have interactive algorithm visualization capabilities. And this is intended as a teaching tool, but it's just kind of fun to look at anyway. So uh, if I bring up, this is not the one that has that link. Let me bring it up, bring up the example first, and then I'll, I'll talk about some of the details of it uh, when, I'm, when I'm done with that. So let me bring up this Minnesota graph uh, around here, the University of Minnesota area. And here it is, make this a little bigger. So first, the first thing I would ask a student to do if they're working with this data is, okay, let's just load this data up in what I call the Highway Data Examiner, HDX, and um, poke around. Get to know it. What's going on here? What are we looking at? What roads do we have? What does this whole thing mean here? So I can click on the points. It'll give me the names of uh, the intersections that, that have been chosen by travel mapping. So this is the intersection of Minnesota 55 with Minnesota 100 over uh, a little to our west. We can click on the edges. It'll tell us uh, what is the name of the route and uh, what are its endpoints and how far is that edge? How, how much distance does that, does that cover? The colors in this case uh, represent how many different route designations share that road of pavement, that segment of pavement. So up here, I-94, uh, I-694, and US-52 all are designations for that same segment of road. So it's colored pink to indicate that. Some of them have only two. I-694 shares pavement with US-10 right there. And the blue ones are individual uh, roads that have only one designation, at least in travel mapping's view. All right, so what do we want to do with this? Well, I would like to be able to have my students experiment with algorithms. So um, I'll go right for the big one here. I'm going to go right to Dijkstra's algorithm. This was the, the first one that I was kind of the motivation for this project, and it was the mo probably the most exciting one to see in action when it finally happened a couple of years ago. So Dijkstra's algorithm says pick a starting point, pick an ending point, and figure out the shortest path from one to the other. And here we're using strictly distances. My data has no notion of speed limits or road closures or anything like that. It's all just what's the shortest distance. So it's not necessarily going to take us down the interstate. It might take us uh, down some roads with lots of traffic lights. But let's say I wanted to go from right around here, an exit just, uh, just nearby here, uh, down to, let's go to the airport, because that's probably where many of us are going after this. So the airport's right here. That's not a very far distance. Uh, what we can do is we can watch this algorithm in action. So I've got on the upper left there, let me slow it down a little bit so it doesn't find it too quickly. We've got on the upper left uh, a pseudocode implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm, which the students would be studying in class uh, at this time. And we're watching the algorithm go through line by line, uh, seeing how is it doing its work to compute this shortest path. And along the way, we've got things changing colors. We've got things green, things that are blue, things that are pink, uh, things that are black. And uh, along the, as, this, uh, as this continues to go, uh, we can see that things that turn blue at each stage are the next closest place I can get to from the start. And things that turn green are the candidate places that I can go next from any place that I've already been. And that's exactly the heart of Dijkstra's algorithm. I just explained that in about 30 seconds, and I feel like the room got a pretty good sense of how this algorithm works. Try to do that by putting the algorithm up on the board and drawing a picture with some A, B, C, D, and connecting it with some, it's going to be impossible. You get a sense for how the algorithm works very quickly by watching it in action on real data. Um, and we can see what are the contents of the data structure here. And as they change, we can see the contents of the, uh, the uh, spanning tree of places that we found so far and, and so on. We can, of course, zoom in like we normally do in all of that stuff as well. And uh, so once you get the idea of what's going on, you get pretty bored, so you speed it up. So let's go as fast as we can here. You see these yellow flashes going by. Those are the candidate edges being pulled out of the priority queue that says this is the next closest place I can get to from the start among the places that I've seen. And very soon here, we're going to get to the entrance to the airport. And when that happens, 
Almost now, come on. Hopefully we don't have bad data here. There it is, it found it. It found its way to the airport. And we can, I don't know what that green guy's doing there. But this is our shortest path from, uh, from I-35. We go down I-35, go to I-94, and in Minnesota, 55, it looks like, uh, pretty much. So it's not, uh, I don't know, it's not something you're going to feed to the public as far as driving directions. It's just a list of points that are somewhat obscurely named, but it gets the idea across. Another nice feature of this is that the students can also implement this in whatever programming language they're, they're, uh, they're using and see that they get the same result because they can take the same data we've done here and feed it to their own programs and see, do I get this, this answer? And if I don't, where did I go wrong? They can put debugging into their own program and see where does this change from what we've got up here. So. Over the last few years, we've implemented several algorithms in this system. Some of them are simple enough that you can show them to kids to give them an idea of, uh, I just did a, uh, a session a couple of weeks ago uh, for some sophomores who were not computer science majors and just had them think about, here's a, here's a bunch of points on a map, find me the northernmost point. And they're all very quick at that, right? Because you look to the top of the map, at least the ones who are good enough with maps to know north is up. Uh, not all. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but then we can go through and say, well, the computer can't do that because the computer has to look at every one along the way. So you can get at some ideas of computational complexity pretty quickly uh, and things along those lines using the visualizations. All right, so let me wrap up my, uh, my main uh, talk here to get to some questions. So uh, the granularity of the route data. I mentioned that earlier, that we only have major intersections and what we consider major highways, that leads to a nice granularity of these graphs. We can get a reasonably sized graph of an area and uh, students are able to work with it. I mentioned this, the, the variety of graph sizes is, uh, is nice. Uh, and there are, there are other features that have come along the way that we can uh, we could look at, but I'd rather uh, save time for some questions. So uh, first, before I take those questions, let me acknowledge uh, several people who've been a big part of this project. Uh, many of them are listed on the travel mapping website. That page that had all the credits for our sources also has a list of our contributors. So let me go back there and make sure that they get, uh, they get seen here. Our project contributors to the travel mapping side are all listed here. These, these folks either have uh, contributed data to the system, or they contribute uh, updates to the data to the system, or even just tell us, hey, something's wrong with the data in your system. Uh, others have made more substantial contributions on the infrastructure side. I did a lot of the early implementation, uh, but Eric Bryant, the second person on that list, has done a lot with that uh, recently. Most of the people are focused on the, uh, the data itself. Uh, the last three summers, I've been fortunate enough to get funding from my college to hire three summer students for six weeks each uh, over, the, uh, over the course of the summer, and they've made giant progress uh, on this. Their names are listed here. They're supported by the Siena College Summer Scholars Program. And before that, I taught at the College of St. Rose, and I had some students there who did this uh, either as part of class projects or, or less officially who were able to, uh, to make the early contributions. And some of the things that are behind the scenes on this that they did totally enabled everything else that we do, like figuring out how do you do event-driven programming in JavaScript when you don't have threads. Uh, so we, had to we have to break down loops and things along those lines, things I had never thought about before trying to do this algorithm visualization part of the project. Um, a lot of those folks helped uh, in great ways to get that uh, going. And here they all are. These are the students who've worked me the last three summers, my 2017 team on the upper left, my 2018 team on the upper right, and the group that finished up this summer uh, down here on the bottom. So anyway, I'd be happy to take some, uh, some questions. I'd love to hear your feedback either on the hobbyist side or the educational side. If you want to map your travels, uh, we'd love to have you as a user. We've just passed 250 users, which is not a whole lot, but it's for a project that has no, uh, no publicity generally. Uh, that's, that's not bad. Uh, and if you, if you or anybody you know teaches computing in any way, um, I'd love to have more people try out the, uh, the metal project. So, uh, and again, thanks to the uh, contribute to the organizers here for for bringing in kind of an unusual talk to this uh, to this conference. So, uh, questions? Yeah. What's the biggest thing, or what what would you like from the new contributors that would be you know, in the next? Uh, I mean, what's the biggest gap you have? 
oh, there are gaps all over the place. If I think on the travel mapping side, we're really in good shape on generating highway data. Uh, we need more people who are good at making nice web pages. Uh, we've got all this data behind the scenes. Uh, we've got a database that was, I'm the architect of that database, and it's the only database I've ever you know, designed. So it's probably not great. It seems to work. But uh, if I had somebody with database experience who can come in and tell me, yeah, no, you shouldn't really do it that way. It'll be much more efficient if you do this or that. I know the basics, but uh, maybe not enough to, uh, to do things right. Uh, but the web front end is a big, a big thing right now. Someone who knows PHP, someone who knows SQL queries, who can get us lots more um, uh, interesting stats out of the database. We have a lot of things that we can get manually through SQL queries that are not presented to our users. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, and as far as the, the, the metal side of the project, um, I'm looking for users, basically, who will, uh, who will try this out and tell me what works and what doesn't with their, their students. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you and uh, safe travels home. <laughs> <laughs>